This is Euler Wars. I made this game because as I was playing through other space sim games, I thought, why do the weapons work like that? Why does the progression system work like that? You know what? I'll make my own game. So that's what I did. The ships that you have to choose from are either platonic solids or Archimedean solids. So the tetrahedron, octahedron cube, those are all things that you would normally see in dice. And those are the platonic solids. And then eventually we start going into the Archimedean solids as the ships get larger and larger uh, with platonic solids mixed in. These are sorted by volume. So the larger the ship, the larger the volume, the more health they have, the more faces they have, the more powerful they get, which is why it's more and more difficult to unlock them. You start off with only having the tetrahedron unlocked, and as you rank up in both level and rank, then you start unlocking additional ships. The way that the ranking system works is ships unlock based on pilot rank. Your pilot rank is the product of your level and your skill rank. Your level increases as you earn experience. Anytime you get kills or you play a race map, you earn experience. So you can grind up your level. Uh, the numbers of how much experience you need is according to the Fibonacci sequence. Meaning that once you start to get into the levels of 20s, the progression starts to grind to a halt. So you can really only get up to about level 20, maybe 25. If you notice, the pilot rank for the highest ship requires 306. That's where your rank comes in. For each kill that you get with each type of ship, in the best run you've had, so in other words, if you kill six ships in the best run, going against uh, ships of the same type, then you gain skill. As you do better in the race game type, you gain skill points. This is only based off of the best that you can do, and in order to rank up your skill, it's a flat 10. 10 to go from 1 to 2, 10 to go from 2 to 3, 10 to go from 3 to 4. And since these are multiplicative, this pilot rank can end up getting very, very large. So let's talk about the ships once you unlock them. Right now I've got the tetrahedron selected and I have four modules that I can choose from. Right now I have turreted rail guns because particularly on fast ships, I like having the ability to have the turrets aim for me. I could also add on fixed rail guns. The difference between turrets and fixed weapons are that the fixed weapons don't automatically aim themselves. You have to manually fire them, but they do a significantly larger amount of damage. So I'm going to stick to turrets because this is a fast ship. It's going to be harder to hit. Shields are a sphere based on where the module is, which means that on the opposite side over here, the shield won't really be protecting. If I want to increase the amount of area protected, I can add on another shield. There's no limit to the number of each module that you can have, particularly on the larger ships. But for right now, I'm going to add a warp boost, which means that I'll be able to travel faster. So I've got two weapons, one shield, one engine boost. So I'll be nice and fast, well protected, and be able to do a lot of damage. So I'll go back and I'll select the game type. In the arena game type, you only go against ships of the same type meaning that if I'm a tetrahedron, I will only see tetrahedrons. After I kill the first wave of one tetrahedron, two will spawn. After I kill that wave, three will spawn, then four, then five. And again, my skill rank is not dependent on how many waves I complete, but what the total number of tetrahedron ships I was able to kill before I was killed. Now the game type is all ship arena. This starts off, no matter what ship I'm flying, with the tetrahedron. Then it progresses onto the octahedron, then the cube, then the icosahedron. So no matter what ship I have, I will go against increasing waves of ships, increasing all the way up to the largest ship. And if I manage to kill all of them once, then it starts back over with the tetrahedron spawning two at a time. That will also increase my skill rank. The third game type is race game type, where a bunch of asteroids spawn in and your job is to find your way out through the maze of the asteroids in the asteroid field. What makes it, what allows you to control the difficulty is by changing the asteroid radius. And if you notice, I can see straight through. This is just representative of the approximate size of the asteroids relative to you. There will be additional asteroids spawned in. So let's go back to Arena to show just the basics of the gameplay. Again, I've already built my ship out in the ship builder and let's play. Now the controls for this game take a while to get used to. It's two hands on the keyboard because it's full six axis control, meaning uh, rotation and translation are both fully defined. 
On your left hand, everything is rotation for looking up, down, left, right, and then rotating clockwise and counterclockwise. On the right hand is all of your translation motion. So forwards, backwards, left, right, up, and down. It'll take some getting used to, but if you stick with it, it's much more freeing to be able to have full six axis control. Part of what I didn't like of some space games is that you only are able to move forward uh, in terms of moving very quickly. In this game, all translation and rotation has equal rates. So in other words, moving forwards moves just as fast as moving left. So you have true even six axis control. Uh, using space to fire is only for fixed weapons. Technically, turrets will also shoot when you hit uh, space, but they'll also automatically aim at anything they can and fire automatically. So let's hop in. And as you can see, there's a turret in front of me. And regardless of how I turn my ship, it works its way to try and aim at the lead reticle, which is seen as a yellow circle on screen, trying to fire at the enemy. On the far left of the screen, you can see a close-up of the enemy so that I can see exactly what modules they have. I can see what weapons they have on their ship to know what kind of danger I'm in. The lead reticles, while I have turrets, aren't super important, but they're going to be very important when trying to use fixed weapons to be able to hit the enemy. As you can see, I'm doing a lot of damage to his shields, but none to his health yet. That's because the shields have not disappeared yet. On the far left of the screen, you notice that he has two shields, one of which is small, one of which is large. As the shields take damage, they weaken and decrease in volume, leaving the rest of your ship more exposed to damage. The recharge rate on the shields is based on their current health. So the more damaged your shields are, the more slowly they regenerate because they're damaged. So when your shields are almost full, they'll recharge very, very quickly. So you want to try and keep your shields as high as possible. Now, if you notice, I had two weapons, but I really only see one stream of bullets going from me to the enemy. So let me rotate the position that I am in my ship. I can hit tab to release rotation lock, as you can see on the right side of the screen. And now when I use rotation controls, I actually rotate from within my ship. So now I have two weapons in front of me. And of course, as I'm showing you guys this, the enemy is getting ahead and starting to take out my shields. But now I have two weapons trained on him, both of which are firing, drastically increasing my the damage that I'm applying. So the only way to recover health is by picking up health packs. And the only way to get health packs is by destroying enemies. So I'm going to finish this guy off and he dropped a health pack. Now, right now I don't need it because I haven't lost any health, so I'm going to save that for later. If you notice, the number of enemies remaining on the bottom left is up to two, which means that there are two enemies. And I can see both of them on screen, but I can only focus on one. Hitting caps lock will automatically focus on the enemy that is closest to forwards, so the, the enemy that will take the least amount of turning uh, to look at. On the small ships, that doesn't really matter because I can spin very quickly, but on the larger ships, it can be very problematic. Now, if you notice, I'm moving around in a fairly controlled way. I'm not running into anything. That's because motion drag is on. Motion drag in space, like air resistance, isn't very realistic, but it's very hard to control when motion drag is off. So I added the ability to toggle it. If you hit M, now all of my hands are off the controls and I'm still moving. So there is no drag, but that also means that if I get a large amount of speed built up, as I'm gonna do here, I can just keep going faster and faster but if I want to turn around and accelerate towards the enemy again, which I'm doing right now, I have to slow down my velocity, so it takes significantly longer. On the right-hand side of the screen, you can see a 3D representation of what my velocity is, as well as acceleration. So there's a blue vector, which is your true vector in space. Red means I'm decelerating in the XYZ uh, coordinate system. Green means I'm accelerating in that direction. So right now, if I'm holding forwards, you see the green y direction is green. If I'm going left or right, the colors change according to the direction of acceleration. That's meant to give you an idea that if you turn off motion drag, you're going to see a lot of white when you pull your hands off the controls, and then colors will start to appear as you accelerate. One of the other advantages to being able to turn within your ship 
is in case modules get destroyed. Each module only has a certain amount of health, so if the module or the plate gets destroyed, you can just turn and face a different part of your ship, making a new portion of your ship the forwards direction. Uh, th this means that if you want to put all of the weapons on your ship facing one direction, that's perfectly fine, but particularly on larger ships, it can be really difficult to make sure that you never take damage. And so if one side of your ship takes damage, you may be completely out of weapons. So it's a good idea to have a, a balanced build on, on the larger ships so that when you do start taking damage, you can just rotate and use a different side of your ship as the primary attack. Another benefit to that is each of these uh, plates, as you notice there's a line going down the middle of the screen, that's the junction point between the two plates. As plates take damage, they become less translucent because as they're more damaged, you can't see through the damage. The reason for that is it increases the difficulty. After a plate takes damage, I can't see through it anymore. So I'm actually going to go back to the main menu and show you what I mean by that. Here we can see a different customization screen on a much larger ship. This is the truncated octahedron, which is made up completely of hexagons and squares. Again, the power of the modules on various faces of the ship are based on the area of that shape. We have no unused modules, which means every armor plate has some sort of module on it. These are the engine boosters. This is a fixed weapon, and I'll show you how that works. So let's go back and let's start our mission. As you, again, as you can see in the left side of the screen, a close-up version of the enemy, we see that he has a bunch of yellow weapons, which means he's using a railgun. These have very high uh, projectile velocities, so I'm going to try and dodge him with the warp boosters that I have, but I'm still end up taking quite a few hits. As you can see, there's a bit of a green tinge coming onto my screen, and that's because I'm taking damage on the hexagon and on the square. I'm doing this intentionally to, to demonstrate what's uh, going to happen. Those loud bangs that you heard were my modules being completely destroyed, and now I'm blind. I can still see the enemy marker, but I can't see where my reticle is. My reticle is actually gone because that module broke, so I need to look to a different part of my ship. Again, I can do that by releasing the rotation lock, re-engaging it, and now I can aim a different part of my ship forwards. He destroyed another one of my modules, he's working on another one of my hexagons, and I'm taking additional damage. And I'm going to be dying soon here because I'm running out of weapons to be able to shoot him with, so I'm, the more destroyed I am, the less likely it is for me to come back. And now I'm dead. Since I didn't manage to kill any, I got zero experience. Now if that looks difficult, it was partially because I wasn't actually trying to defeat him. I wanted to show you guys what happens when you start getting destroyed. The more destroyed your ship is, the more difficult it is for you to be able to see where the enemy is, follow them, navigate through the arena, as well as fire back. Because once a module is destroyed, it can't come back. There are health modules that will repair your module health, plate health, and your overall ship health. However, they do not bring back modules that have already been destroyed. One of the other main game types is the time trial. Your goal is to get out of an asteroid field as fast as possible. Now I can have a straight shot out of this asteroid field at this radius, but that's only because we're on the main menu. In the game, there will be a significantly larger number of asteroids that I'll have to dodge, so the density will increase. You can increase the asteroid radius up to 55 and down to 25 and anywhere in between. The larger the asteroid radius, the harder it will be, but the more experience you'll get for completing it and the more skill you'll get for completing it. The ship I've chosen here is the Octahedron. One of the reasons for that is because it's a very small ship, which is beneficial for getting through tight spaces. I've also only used the Warp Booster, which provides an increased engine power allowing me to go faster. Impacting asteroids does not hurt you, so there's no reason to use shields, and there are no enemies, so there's no reason to use weapons. So let's go ahead and get started with this.
as you can see, there's still a target reticle. And as I move left and right, it moves very, very quickly. That target reticle shows me the closest point to the outside of the asteroid field. The asteroid field is a perfect sphere. So as I move around, it's going to move to the closest point to the edge of that sphere. As I get further away from the center, the rate at which that target reticle is going to move decreases until it's almost zero out at the edges. If I want to boost, I can double tap any lateral direction and I'll go through my boost meter at the top of the screen. That's also available in all the other game types, but it's particularly useful in the race game type. Now, as you can see, I'm still trying to dodge the asteroids, but I can turn motion drag off for those long straightaways like this one, turn motion drag off, boost forward, turn motion drag on to slow down to make sure that I don't hit the asteroid. I see the outside and I'm gonna boost for it and I've completed. Final time is just over a minute. The experience that I gain is based on the time as well as the asteroid size. So the larger the asteroids, the more experience I'll get. But the lower the time, the more experience I'll get. One of the things that I want to demonstrate is the more difficult version of the time trial. I'm going to max out the asteroid radius and try the same thing again. Now, as you can see, Getting out of here is going to be significantly more difficult. If I were in a larger ship, I may start getting stuck in some of these gaps. So I need to be much more careful as I move around. The asteroids that spawn in are always the same, meaning that if you find one path out, that path will always be available to you no matter when you start the game type. One of the other problems with having larger asteroids like this is you don't know when you'll end up coming to a dead end. For instance, now, that's one of the reasons that I added the target reticle, seeing the outside of the level, is to make sure that you know approximately which direction you need to move. There's also the distance from the center to show you if you're going in the right direction. Because right now, I am heading towards the outside, but not very quickly. So your goal for this is to find the best possible route with the max asteroid size. The final game type is the all ship arena game type. Your enemies will start off being tetrahedrons, then octahedrons, then cubes, then icosahedrons, all the way up to truncated icosadodecahedrons. Once you've killed each of those once, it will start spawning two tetrahedrons, then two octahedrons, then two cubes, all the way up through two truncated icosadodecahedrons. Go for as long as you can. The experience that you get is based on the amount of points that you get. The points that you get is based on the size of the ship. The skill that you get is associated with two things. Number one, the points that you earn, and number two, the ship that you earned those points with. So let's say that I managed to kill up to the cube and I was using a tetrahedron. I'll get a fairly high skill rank out of that because I'm destroying ships that are larger than me. However, if I used a truncated tetrahedron, I have plenty of firepower. And if I only managed to kill up to the cube, I won't have as much of a skill rank as if I had used the tetrahedron. At this point, I want to pull attention back to the level and skill rank, pilot rank, experience, skill. I've thrown those terms around quite a few times already. Your level is based on the experience that you get. Your skill rank is based on your skill ratings for each of the ships. I don't actually have this absurdly large amount of skill. I did that prog programmatically so that I could show you all of the ships in this demonstration. The reason that I separated the ranking system out into levels and skill ranks is to provide a balance between good players and time committed players. If you aren't very good, but you enjoy the game and you want to unlock additional ships, you can grind out a lot of experience to increase your level. If you're a very good player, and you can gain lots of skill points, uh, particularly in the arena game type, killing large numbers of tetrahedrons with a tetrahedron, demonstrating that you're much better than the AI. You can increase your pilot rank with both grind and skill. And I thought that that is the fairest progression system possible to allow all types of players and all gameplay styles to unlock the additional ships. Now, as I've been describing the pilot rank, you may be wondering, what does it unlock for me? The only thing it unlocks is the new ships. 
Now there are 18 ships to unlock, so depending on your skill level, it may take you some time to unlock those, but all of the locations are unlocked from the start. That way, if you are struggling with a particular location or you're not a big fan of it, you won't be forced to play the same location over and over again. Likewise, all of the modules are unlocked right from the start. The reason for this is if I limited the number of modules that you could have access to until you got larger ships unlocked, that would mean by the time I get to a rhombic cubic dehedron and I unlock all of the uh, modules, I would be forced to go back to the tetrahedron because now that I have better weapons, obviously I would do better and gain a higher skill rank. I want a new player that is already good at these types of games to be able to get the best possible skill rank they can with the amount of practice that they have and not have to worry about being artificially limited by the game. The only limitation that you have to surpass through the pilot rank is unlocking the additional ships. Finally, I want to give you some background on why I made this game. I saw a bunch of issues in various other space simulator games and I wanted to make a game that I enjoyed playing and hopefully fixed and addressed most of those issues. The ranking system I think is a good example of that. I wanted to find a balance between player skill and grind, allowing both of them to unlock new ships, but really needing a conjunction of both. I also wanted ships that made sense. I don't want to fly around in a plane in space. I don't want the physics to be like a plane if you're out in space. I based the controls off of six degrees of freedom as closely as I could while still making fun gameplay. I designed this game so that I wouldn't feel like I was wasting my time grinding, but that I was actually challenged, and I wanted a game that I really enjoyed playing without the negatives that I saw in other games. I enjoy playing it, and I sincerely hope that you do too.